Hello, I'm John Dee and this is Energy Insights. It's a program where we look at the members of RE100 and the ways in which they're going 100% renewable with their electricity use. In this episode, we're going to take a look at Apple. As an organization, Apple has become incredibly successful with the iPhone, iPad, Mac, Apple Watch and Apple TV. With 1.4 billion active devices around the world, Apple became the first American company to reach a $2 trillion valuation. In 2020, the company also pledged that every Apple device will be produced with net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Well, to find out more about Apple and its energy use, we're joined today by Lisa Jackson. Lisa is Apple's Vice President of Environment, Policy and Social Initiatives. Before joining Apple, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to be the first African-American administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Since she joined Apple in 2013, Lisa has helped the organization to become an environmental leader. And I'm glad to say that she joins us now. Lisa, thanks for being with us. Apple joined RE100 in 2016. It's been working on renewable energy for some time now. Can you describe how that renewables program actually got underway? Yeah, we started our work in renewable energy um, almost a decade ago, and we started at home. You know, we started with bringing our own corporate operations to 100% um, renewable, and we started with the hardest piece, which was data centers, because data centers run all the time. They need energy, they have to have it, and we wanted to show that you could run a data center on 100% renewable energy. And for a long time, we were the only company that did run data, our data centers on 100% renewable energy. After that, we moved to our corporate uh, offices around the world and our retail stores around the world until by 2018, every one of them was running on 100% renewable energy. In addition to going renewable with your own electricity use, Apple has been reaching out to suppliers to get them to go renewable as well. How do you go about getting suppliers on board and, and what kind of response are you getting from them? You know, it's a great, a great question, John, because you have to bring suppliers along just like you bring them on um, to, to manufacture on our behalf. We have high standards. We let folks know in our supply chain that clean energy, the kind we use, is very important to us, that it can be cheaper than dirty energy, and that we're willing to take that walk with them. So a lot of times that walk really means passing on technical information, giving know-how to people. It's oftentimes companies who their first or second job is not to procure clean energy. So they just want to know that someone who knows what they're doing will be there as a partner to help them along the way. Then uh, occasionally it means investing right alongside them. And we feel great about doing this because we know that clean energy in this day and age does yield a return and it's one that's positive. And so it's a good investment, both for us and for our partners. When it comes to engaging your staff and stakeholders about renewable energy, how useful has it been being a member of RE100 and having that 100% renewables target? Yeah, you know, uh, what RE100 has done for us, you know, we had the target when we joined, we were pretty much there, but to be able, as you said, to engage across with other companies, to have that, that level of know-how, that level of we're all in this together, that we know that all together we're stronger and we're a force for real good and real clean energy in this world. Those are all important moments. And then it, it allows us opportunities to, to tout their leadership, to show the other companies who are coming along, to let them have their moment to say, you know, for us to applaud them. Um, it's not it's not work we're doing, it's work that they've signed up to do. And it's great to know that, that RE100 exists in order to give companies that extra level of uh, partnership and cohesion to come together around these goals. 
talking uh, about renewables, some people have said that uh, renewables are bad uh, for the business bottom line. What is your opinion on that? When, when Apple uses renewable energy, does it cost you more or is it actually saving you money? Yeah, that's an easy one because we look for projects that are actually good for our bottom line. They can be good in two ways. First off, they give us a set supply and price for energy long into the future. Clean energy, you don't have to worry about the price of the sun. It is free. It is going to be there. Wind is going to be there. So you can price that in better into forecasts going forward. But the truth of the matter is that technology has come along to the point that if you're starting from scratch, clean energy is much cheaper to install and operate. So what we all have to do as businesses is demand access to grids so that we can put cheaper, cleaner energy on for our customers and for our own use. And I think that's a really important uh, uh, other thing that RE100 can do, which is advocate amongst governments around the world to make that transition easier for businesses who want to step up and lead. Apple's already uh, carbon neutral for its global carbon emissions, but for 2030, you're also committing to be 100% carbon neutral for both your supply chain and your products as well. How important is collaboration with your supply chain when it comes to bringing that about? Oh, it's, it's incredibly important, especially if you look at Apple's carbon footprint, now still well over 70% of our carbon footprint lies in our supply chain. That's because we've done a really good job of taking care of our own energy use. So now it really is the energy use and the direct emissions from our manufacturing partners. And that requires thinking differently about how products are made, how they're manufactured, but also about energy opportunities, ways to cut down on the amount of energy needed and ways to use more recycled material. All of those require know-how that resides not only in Apple, but with our manufacturing partners. Part of what we can do, John, is make it clear that this is really important work to Apple. This is an innovation that's as important as any other innovation we might have. And what it means is that our manufacturing partners are coming on the journey with us to look for opportunities to cut down on energy use or water use or use more recycled materials or recycle materials as part of the manufacturing process or move to zero waste. Those are all opportunities that we see sort of just blooming, if you will, um, across the landscape with our suppliers. And one more, one more opportunity is if we really want to be carbon neutral by 2030, we have 10 years to also help our customers use more clean energy because we also look at the carbon footprint of charging your device as part of our carbon footprint. So we have lots of work to do, lots of opportunities to invest around the world in clean energy and in manufacturing innovation. As you know, Lisa, materials efficiency and energy efficiency are really beneficial to the environment as well as to the financial bottom line. Could you maybe give us some examples of the efficiency initiatives that Apple is currently undertaking? Oh, sure. Uh, look, I love the fact that we are seeing the first opportunity to, to use clean energy is not using energy at all. I often say that the cleanest energy is the energy you never have to use. So our supplier responsibility team has a special group dedicated to energy efficiency, to helping suppliers run energy audits in, our, in order to find places where they may be using more energy than they need. Our suppliers love that because it cuts down on their cost of doing business. And so it means that their profit can be higher and they're using less energy. They're spending less money to make, to make components or to make materials. There's tons of opportunity in efficiency. There's also opportunity in efficiency of our devices. The less energy that our devices need to charge, the better, the better for our customers because it means our batteries are, are able to last longer. Customers need to charge less, <clears throat> something that they like very much. But it also means that our carbon footprint in the world is that much smaller. If you multiply the energy savings in our products by the billion plus devices that we have in the world, it adds up to a pretty 
huge uh, savings in terms of carbon emissions. Back in 1970, Lisa, you were eight years old and you wrote a letter to President Nixon. I think you said something like, you need to do something about all of this pollution. Um, <laughs> what is your advice to children who want to tackle climate change and create a better world? Yeah, I'm not sure that's a direct quote. I probably would have, um, my mom would have told me to be very respectful, but I remember being, as many young people are, and certainly as we see today, just very, very sort of almost appalled that the grown-ups around me didn't understand how important it was to think beyond today, but to think to tomorrow, which of course is is the future for uh, all of our kids. Um, it's, it is really inspiring to me to see what young people are doing. They are demanding change. They are educating themselves about options. And they are looking for not just concrete promises, but actual transparency about what is actually being done. Another wonderful role that RE100 plays, which is to make it clear that, that companies are stepping up. Um, I think that it's important for companies to also remember that these young people are their future employees, are the people, are their future customers, might be their current customers. And so they are telling us in no uncertain terms what they expect a business to do um, in their day and age. And I think there's so much that we can learn about optimism, a little bit of healthy impatience, if you will, um, we all like to talk about patience being, patience being a virtue, but in the case of climate change, in the case of pollution, it's not a virtue if it's your community that's being impacted today. So tons of opportunity and tons of optimism around what we see happening in the world amongst our younger generation. Lisa, final question. For companies that are just setting out on their sustainability and renewables journey, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I think the first is to recognize the opportunity in the moment to not just do the right thing, but to engage your employees. You'll be surprised. I have been surprised, even at Apple, the most innovative company in the world, at how willing our employees have been to try something new if it might be great for the planet, if it might help cut our carbon footprint, if it might uh, impact um, the materials we use or recyclability. So don't underestimate the incredible energy, enthusiasm, and ideas that will come from inside. Set your sights high, I believe, in big goals. Set yourselves as globally as your reach is. So if you're small, it's fine. If you're a multinational, it's not just the United States. It's not just your footprint, it's very much about your supply chain uh, as well. And so don't, don't shortchange, don't shortchange the environment um, and don't shortchange yourself or your customers. Thank you so much for your time today, Lisa. We really appreciate it. Thanks, John, it's great to be with you. Well, that was Lisa Jackson, Apple's Vice President of Environment, Policy and Social Initiatives. Now, before I go, do let me give you some contact information for RE100. You can check out our website at re100.org or email us via info at re100.org. If your business is a big energy user and you're interested in joining RE100, please do get in touch. I'm John D. On behalf of the Climate Group, CDP and Do Something Australia, thanks for joining us. Bye for now.